All right, good afternoon. Uh, we're going to spend the next 10 minutes doing something hopefully a little bit, little bit different and taking a slightly different uh, view of things um, by talking about uh, mapping our journey to accessibility. And that's what we can learn about accessibility from maps. So my name is uh, Joe Glombeck. Um, and although my day job is a back-end web developer, I take a lot of interest in the front-end world and deem myself a bit of an accessibility advocate. I'm also a real outdoors enthusiast, but we'll come on to why that's relevant in a bit. Um, accessibility is a fairly new concept in the world of the web. The web itself is only in its early 30s, and that's not much older than myself. And I think it's fair to say that accessibility wasn't a priority in Web 2.0. So to catch up, it makes a lot of sense to stand on the shoulders of giants. So what can we learn about accessibility from the real world that we can apply to the world of the web? The real world contains thousands of examples of accessible design, from accessible parking spaces and accessible toilets to tactile paving and hearing loops. But it can be quite difficult to find parallels to some of those issues that we come across on the web. So. If only there was something from the analog world that conveyed information in a visual way, more like a website does. I'm sure you can tell where I'm going with this. Let's talk about maps. So outside the office, I'm a real outdoor enthusiast, uh, generally accompanied by my girlfriend, Kirsty, who's a geographer, and my dog, Carter. Uh, we enjoy hiking, camping, canoeing, and much more. And many of these activities require the use of maps for our enjoyment, and for our safety. So what with me being an avid map user and my girlfriend being a geographer, one day we started to discuss the accessibility of maps and I realized there were many parallels that we could draw to the web. Some caveats though, um, we're gonna take a look at how maps are an accessible method of re visually representing data. The outdoor maps I'm gonna show you uh, are pretty poor at highlighting accessible features, or, uh, facilities or routes. Um, you won't find accessible toilets, paved footpaths, footpaths without styles, etc. marked on these maps. I do, however, think that as a visual method of representing data, they are a good example, even if they don't convey information about accessible features, if that makes sense. <laughs> so why are we looking at maps? Uh, mapping has been around for a long time, and the web, it hasn't. Uh, so we've had a map of Mundi, uh, which is a sort of crude religion-centered map, uh, maps of the, of the known world. And they were created in the early 14th century. And then serious mapping of English towns began in the 16th century. While Ordnance Surveys, whose maps I generally use, they started their work in 1791. So what have Ordnance Survey done in those past two centuries to improve their maps usability? And what can we learn from them? Uh, Ordnance Survey, by the way, are the sort of major mapping provider in the UK. Um, and as much as I'd like to use Ordnance Survey maps in this presentation, they have extremely strict licensing rules. Uh, so today I'm actually using the Outdoors map by Thunder Forest, and that's based on OpenStreetMap data. And you can find that at opencyclemap.org. And we're going to be looking at a map of one of my favorite towns in the UK, and that's Ambleside in the Lake District. So maps have a low barrier to entry, and I'll explain what I mean. Um, if I gave you a map you'd never seen before and asked you to point out a lake, a river, woodland, or roads, I'm sure many of you would have very little issue in doing so. They use logical colors, shapes, and symbols which reflect the real world. Focusing on symbols for a little bit, I'm sure you can take a very reasonable guess as to what each of these mean without even looking at the key in the map. Let's I'll give you the answer straight away. <laughs> Spoilers. Uh, so that's a campsite, a pub, a coniferous woodland, a car park, boat hire, boat trips, uh, tourist information, bike hire, cycle trail, uh, and a castle or fort. But maps are really detailed for those people who are looking for that detail. So you can spot hilltops, valleys, steep cliffs, and all of these can be read from the contour lines, which on this map are the thin grey lines that you can see uh, flowing around each other. You can even tell if a church has a spire or a tower, or if a woodland is deciduous, coniferous, or mixed. 
You've also got uh, your power lines and your fences and the type of footpath that can even be, be read um, from this type of map. But they don't provide too much noise. It's not too busy just by looking at it. And in a digital map, like Google Maps or OpenStreetMap, uh, more or less detail can be rendered depending on the zoom level. So zoomed out over there, um, we see the bigger picture. We see town names and major roads. But as we start to zoom in, we see minor roads appearing and buildings, as well as uh, the names of smaller areas and more points of interest. You start to see the car parks, pubs, restaurants, public toilets, hotels. We even lose sight of the bigger picture, like the town name has disappeared, um, because they become less appropriate as we zoom in. And print maps do exactly the same thing. So Ordnance Survey released several scales of map, uh, each with different levels of detail. The 1 to 25,000 scale, which is 4 centimetres on the map, is 1 kilometre in the real world. And that's commonly used by hikers, so that they can see the intricacies of tiny crossing footpaths. If you're cycling, however, uh, you can travel so far in a day that a 1 to, to, to 25,000 scale map is fairly useless to you. So then you might use a 1 to 50,000 scale map, and that's 2 centimetres on the page, being 1 kilometre in the real world. Um, that way you don't see so many of the little footpaths or the de exact detail, but many of the cycle tracks are clearly marked, and there's enough detail to appease someone who's travelling through the landscape a bit faster. We also get several methods of receiving data. So heights can be provided as uh, spot heights. They're also provided in contour lines and the contour numbers. And as a reader, you can choose which method is most appropriate to you. So if I'm climbing, uh, climbing Loughrigg Fell and I want to get an approximate height I'm going to be climbing that day, I can be take the spot heights at the top of the peak. So it's going to be about 336 metres. But for a more detailed estimate, you can count the individual ups and downs on, along the route using the contour lines. We've also got a really solid data structure. So generally speaking, uh, the more important the location, the more prominent its name will appear on the map. And this makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, if I want to find Loughrigg Fell, uh, then I'd have very little chance of finding it unless I first look for the county of Cumbria. Then I look for Ambleside, and finally, for Loughrigg. And the prominence of these place names, therefore, reflect, reflects the structure, uh, making smaller places easy to find. We've also got a very low reliance on colour. A good map will generally use high contrasting colours um, to help different features stand out, and text is often outlined in white or very carefully positioned on a manually uh, designed map to make it stand out from the background. Shaded areas such as woodland and grassland will usually have a tree or grass symbol, so they can be identified without relying on co just colour. Uh, as you can see, the, open, uh, the Ordnance Survey and OpenStreetMaps uh, work quite well in the monochrome, as anyone with a budget-conscious photocopier, happy uh, secondary school geography teacher will appreciate, and that makes them colourblind friendly as well. Where colour is used, uh, it's used to enhance. So the text colour on these maps is contextual to help identify what label is labelling. Uh, so a river is labelled in blue and woodland is labelled in green, that sort of thing. Now, uh, paper maps don't work well for people with severe visual impairment or blindness, uh, but just to briefly cover some of the options available, um, many digital mapping apps uh, provide a reasonable navigation experience um, with a screen reader or using navigation directions or vibrations. Um, it's also possible to print 3D maps based on OpenStreetMap data and uh, using services like touch-mapper.org. And also OpenStreetMap has several projects uh, to provide accessibility to the OpenStreetMap services for blind and visually impaired persons. Um, more information is available on the OpenStreetMap wiki. But what can we take away from these this this the, the look at this look into maps then? Maps uh, avoid information overload. They only include the information that people need. Uh, they provide m more information, though, for those who want it. They're not oversimplifying. There's a clear data structure, ensuring that sections are, are clear to allow for that skimming for places. They ensure a high contrast. 
Uh, they don't depend on colour, but it is used to provide that extra supplemental information. And there's more than one inf way to find information. So applying that to the web then, avoiding, the inform in avoiding that information overload, um, although it's not Although there's a lot of information in the detailed maps we looked at today, they don't distract from that basic information. So on the web, uh, we should be careful to only include the information people need. We don't want to be waffling, and uh, we don't need that information that the user is unlikely to want or need. Uh, we can summarize the content of a page early on to save users scrolling through all the detail if they don't need to be on that page at all. We also want to provide more information, though, to those who want it. So simplifying information doesn't mean we need to trivialize it. Uh, people with more in people, the people who need more information, you need to provide that inf in-depth information further down in an article or by linking to other pages, which go into more detail on that specific subject. Thinking about the data structure, then uh, it might seem obvious to give bigger towns a larger text on a map, but we also need to ensure that our sections are clear on our websites to allow for skim reading. Um, so we're using those appropriate headings, h1 to h6, and semantic markup. And it applies to your site as a whole as well. So think about your site structure and your menus as well. As for high contrast, there's no reason not to. Uh, check your colors against contrast checkers and make sure any text overlaying an image uh, will always meet those requirements, especially important in a CMS where that image might be changed in the future uh, or where a responsive design might change how that image is cropped. Uh, it might be worth suggesting brand guidelines are amended as well. If, they, if the brand guidelines don't allow for certain color choices um, that are accessible, it might be worth raising that as an issue. Um, don't depend on color, uh, but it can be very useful to provide that supplemental information like we talked about. Uh, if you're using color to invade something, convey something important, you're also going to want to use an icon or a pattern as well. Um, and finally, we want to provide more than one way to obtain information. So cross-link to related content and provide key information from a graph in text as well. Uh, make sure your users can find that important information. That's why your website exists at all. That's it. Thank you very much. Um, you can find more information on my blog there where I take a look at um, audience survey maps in the same sort of environment, but with a little bit more detail. And that blog is joe.gl, and you should be able to find it from there. Thank you very much for listening and enjoy the rest of your day.